Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following her work for a couple months now over on financial Twitter. She actually just put out a month ago a really great video going in-depth on the future of the oil industry, where the oil reserve growth is going to come from, where the oil production growth is going to come from. I'll put a link to her video presentation from a month ago on her YouTube channel in the information and description section of the video. Her bio is she was a petroleum engineer with Chevron and Hess Oil for over a decade. She also has an MBA and she's a personal energy investor, investing her own capital into oil and natural gas. Christine Guerrero, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate this opportunity. So Christine, we're recording this interview on Friday, May 26, 2023. For our listeners out there, we've had a little bit of a rally in West Texas intermediate crude oil prices the last week or so. They were threatening to get under $70 a barrel. They're almost at $73 a barrel on a rally. The U.S. natural gas prices are back down again after another rally, back down to below $2.20. But I want to get your thoughts first on the shale oil production. So I, I know you've been critical of shale oil on your tweets. Do you think that production, oil production in the shale oil patch uh, in the Permian Basin specifically, which is where the majority of the oil production growth has come from since 2008 in the U.S. and globally. Do you think that that production is peaking? I do think it's peaking. So if you look at the production ramp up that's occurred you know, in the shale oil plays um, and the Permian being the predominant shale oil play in the U.S., the there was a tremendous ramp up from 2017, basically through 2020, um, and and then in 20 uh, in 2020, I mean, obviously, you know, COVID occurred, rigs were dropped, the production dropped almost instantaneously because oil uh, oil wells in shale basins they when they come online they hit pre production within a few months and then they exponentially decline. Um, unlike uh, oil wells in conventional plays that don't require fracking, they have much lower decline rates. So, so when, like for instance, for an offshore field, uh, if when that comes online, you know, some wells might even have a peak production, you know, of multiple years before it declines, depending on how that well was programmed. But, um, but, you know, but anyway, so back to shale, I, like no, no shale well is going to have an extended plateau of, of a peak production rate. It comes on within a few months, hits its max, and then exponentially declines. So when you stop drilling, it doesn't take more than a few months before you start seeing exponential declines in, um, in, in shale basins, which is exactly what occurred in 2020. And then um, when the price of oil started recovering, uh, kind of you know, mid-2020, you, you, you saw that there was kind of a floor on there and slowly rigs started getting picked back up. And, um, and so you can kind of see a steady climb in the shale oil production, you know, from mid-2020 until now. But that curve is a lot flatter than the curve uh, from the previous growth phase. And and also, um, if you get you know really detailed in your analysis, you start to see that these fields are producing more and more gas. So so even if a company's um, equivalent barrel production year over year is the same, what it's starting to look like is that they're having a higher percentage of that equivalent barrel be a gas cut and a, and a slightly smaller be oil cut. And that's something that occurs in every oil field in the world. So it's called your gas oil ratio, your GOR. So, so basically at the beginning of the life of the field, it'll tend to have more liquids and a smaller cut of associated gas. And then over time, it gets more and more gassy with associated gas. So that gas oil ratio climbs over time. And once it starts climbing, it's really hard to you know, stimulate the fields or really do anything to it to decrease that decline because you tend to drill your uh, your best acreage first. And so you're trying to do the same with more or the, you're trying to do the same uh, outflow later on in life that you did with like your uh, your premier um, uh, drill sites at the beginning of the life. And it just doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's just not possible. So, so that, you know, we are kind of starting to see a little turn here. I mean, that doesn't mean that shells uninvestable, you know, it just means that I don't think that um, 
that that's where the growth is going to come from. You know, I think it's going to be more of a, of a steady state free cash flow type asset where maybe P, uh, investors are seeking uh, dividends or multiple expansion, but it's not like there's going to be a growth catalyst. Um, what, what we're seeing is that uh, companies are, you know, buying private companies or, or there's like mergers of equals between the plays. But when that occurs, you're really not increasing basin output. All you're doing is tagging, changing the tag on the wellhead from company to A to company B. So, so there's two ways to grow. You know, if you're if you're a company, you can grow organically by finding new oil and and you know organically growing your company, or you can merge through acquisitions where you try to go take out a cheaper valued company and get those barrels to be valued at the same valuation as as you uh, have. Yeah, ExxonMobil is actually looking, potentially looking at doing this. There's a lot of rumors the last four to six weeks of ExxonMobil looking at either a Pioneer Natural Resources, which I think is the largest producer in the Permian right now, uh, the largest independent play producer in the Permian or one of the other of sizable. But that kind of reminds me of ExxonMobil buying at the peak of, I think, the shale gas boom about seven or eight years ago with XTO. Exxon made enormous mistakes with XTO. I think they paid over $40 billion for XTO and had a lot of losses on that deal. Well, and then, you know, you probably noticed that I was one of the first people that actually pushed back on the thesis that Exxon would buy Pioneer. Because when you look at their value measures, Pioneer, that acquisition is not accretive to Exxon. And, and, and you know, that's what companies want when they do acquisitions. You know, they want value accretive barrels. So you're not, if you're trading with the PE, you know, of seven or eight, you're not going to go buy a company that also has a PE of seven or eight. You're you're equally valued. You're you're going to go bottom feed, which is exactly what Chevron did with their uh, recent acquisition. Um, so Chevron, it was just announced this past week that they bought PDC Energy. So I want to say um, Chevron probably has a, a PE right now of of seven or eight, and whereas PDC only had a PE had a PE of two. So immediately, all those PDC barrels entering Chevron's portfolio are, are value accretive because, because it's buying barrels discounted to their current barrels. And, and in addition to that, so PDC Energy, I mean, it's not a pioneer play. Or, uh, sorry, it's not a Permian play. It's, it's Colorado, it's actually, right? Is in Colorado? Yeah, it's Colorado. It's in the, yeah, the Denver, the Denver uh, Basin. And, and like one thing that I saw for the first time that I thought was really interesting on their um, on their merger slides was that there was a slide dedicated to um, carbon emissions, and so Colorado has been really aggressive with its um, you know with its uh, with you know with its carbon and with their regulations regarding emissions and whatnot, and and because of the cal- the uh, Colorado specific emission standards, PDC Energy had like a super low um, emissions profile, which is also very attractive to Chevron because Chevron has has targets and and PDC was already below their targets. So not only was it accretive in terms of the value per barrel, but it was also accretive in terms of the emissions, um, you know, the emission standards. So you've in your video you've talked about return on investment for shale oil companies versus deep water wells. Do you think that the return on investment for a lot of these shale wells now, especially with the capex maintenance capex, because of the decline rates at the wells, and some of these wells after three years their decline rates over seventy percent. Do you think that the return on investment for a lot of these uh, shale wells now is very poor relative to oil companies um, built bringing online deep water offshore wells? Well. So once the well is already on, it's not like there's going to be a lot of maintenance capex to go on it. So if a, if a well came on and within a few months, let's say it's it's now producing at thirty percent what if it's what its initial rates were, you know you're at a stage where those are kind of free free barrels. So you're getting free cash flow from those old, um, you know those older wells that are no longer producing optimally but the thing is is they're still producing they're they're the the only cost that's really going to be associated with them is going to be their abandonment end of life cost 
And, and if there ever ends up being any issues where uh, maybe you have to shut them in because of weather or uh, flow capacity or whatever. So, so, uh, you know, again, like these companies with tens of thousands of, of wells or even hundreds of thousands of wells. I mean, there, there are hundreds of thousands of wells, you know, in the Permian, you know, at one point in time, those fields are going to become so mature that those are going to be hundreds of thousands of wells that need to be capped and abandoned. And, th- and that's going to be a huge expense. And when that occurs, I don't think any of the majors are still going to be in those fields. They're, they're going to uh, get, you know, basically these fields are going to get to a certain point in time where the runway, you, you start seeing that end of life coming closer and closer. And at that point in time, you'll start seeing the majors exit. And, and at that point in time, in my opinion, I would want to see those fields controlled by uh, private companies instead of public companies. Because oh. it's, it's going to be really hard for in, uh, public investors to want to be invested in, in fields like that. I mean, the, and, and I, Wall Street will be really critical of them. So, it, it, you know, there, there's going to be there's going to be a handover at some point in time. And and is that five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now? You know, I, like I haven't gone in that d- deep to uh, to uh, prognose that. But but I do think that it's coming. You know, I like but for me, I tend to focus on growth basins because I'd rather look to a bright and shiny future instead of being trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> like when when my well hits that uh, economic break even. Yeah, I think that's a problem with a lot of the Permian production and the shale oil companies right now is I just see higher capex bills. I don't see them being able to drastically lower costs. I mean, a a lot of the the innovations for horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, it just becomes more efficient at pulling the oil out of the ground faster. They're just really good for a basic analogy of putting a lot more straws in the ground and sucking the oil out faster and more efficiently. But then that the long life of the well, the decline rate on most of the wells falls rapidly. Our mutual friend, Josh Young, who's an oil hedge fund manager, I interview him all the time. He was taught, uh, one of his investment thesis is he looks for low decline wells. So he looks for these companies that actually put those assets together, like you said, that are the older assets that have lower dec- decline rate wells where the wells are not dropping 60% in a year or something like that. So I guess like a Sandridge Energy here in the United States, but mostly Canadian plays where the decline rates are lower. And then they just buy a bunch of those assets and they're more of a value play. Yeah. And and so those type uh, companies, they don't tend to be attractive to the majors because the majors are looking for a lot of volume and you're not going to get a lot of volume out of those type wells. Those type wells don't produce a lot, but that doesn't mean that they can't be good investments. So so really, you know, when it comes down to where you're putting your dollar, you just need to understand what you're investing in. I mean, the reason that in the Permian we're seeing these cost increases is that companies are desperately trying to maintain their production. So they have to keep drilling in order to keep their production flat. Uh, they don't. No one wants to be the first company to see their production fall off because you're just going to get hammered. Your, your stock's going to go to oblivion and none of your insiders are going to be able to cash out. So, so that's why you see this spend is everyone's like trying to say, no, we're good. We can stay flat. We've got lots of run, run, runway, you know, and they just keep drilling. But uh, but eventually there's going to be a breakover where you start seeing companies' productions decline, and um, th- that's that's when it's really going to get interesting. <laughs> I've seen some estimates from some of these uh, companies that have to drill constantly, drill because they have such high decline rates that they're actual they don't generate a lot of free cash flow until seventy, seventy five, eighty dollar a barrel oil for shale. Well, yeah, because just like costs are, inc- are increasing, the break evens are increasing. You know, during during the COVID days when everyone was uh, not drilling and they were just completing their ducts, which are drilled uncompleted wells, basically they had a queue of of wells that they had uh, drilled in the you know in the years before COVID that was kind of like sitting in a piggy bank, uh, and and so half of their costs were already behind them, and so and so in twenty. 20- 20 and 2021, they were just paying to complete those wells. And then and then they were announcing to the market, you know, about their super low new cost models. And, you know, and they were also um, basically paying their vendors breakneck rates 
because those vendors were doing everything that they could to just survive and keep their doors open. So, and, so you, and, uh, by vendors, sorry to interrupt. So you, by vendors, you mean like the oil service companies, so the drillers like a Schlumberger or a Baker use those types yeah, of, yeah, they were exactly, just, they were exactly. Dis- so 2019 and 2020, even before the pandemic, those guys were starting to discount prices to get any business. Uh, no, they were actually ramping back up in 2019. So um, they in so and again, like I'm I'm speaking now from a, from an industry insider. So in 2019, a lot of companies they were looking to ramp up their staff because because they knew as an industry that they hadn't invested enough money over over the prior five years in order to like maintain their reserves runway because as you and when I talk about reserves runway. You know, basically reserves is how many barrels that you currently have in your portfolio. And the runway is the number of years that you can produce at your current rate before you run out of oil and gas. And so so some companies might have a reserves runway of eight years. Other companies might have a a reserves runway of 15 years. But, you know, I mean, common sense dictates that the shorter the runway is, the more aggressive you have to be to go out and, and explore and do deals and capture more barrels um, profitably to extend your runway. And so, and so, you know, back to 2019, there had been five years of underinvestment. The industry was like, hey, we've got to get back to work. You know, we've got to go find new barrels. We've got to, we've got to start rebuilding these portfolios. And, and unfortunately, what happened, because I mean, all these jobs were posting, they were interviewing, they were bringing people on board, and then 2020 hit. And, and next thing you know, they're closing all their job postings. They're laying off people they had just uh, hired and they're offering uh, retirement packages for, for all of their older people in order to reduce their headcount. And so and so now here we are, you know, three years later, there's there's a smaller workforce because all of the, the folks that retired, they're not coming back. The the oil industry for the last 10 years has had a problem with an aging workforce. And so, you know, when when 10 or 15% of your staff leave in 2020 and that 10 or 15% are 55 plus years old, I mean, how many of them are really going to come back when they're when they're now, you know, 60 years old? You know, I mean, th- those people for the most part don't want to work. They want to go enjoy the the uh their labor, you know, the fruits of their labor over over a 40 year career. So, you know, every now and then you might get one out of 100 come back. But but, you know, we've got a workforce issue. We've got a labor problem. You know, we've the the people um, that want to work are that have experience are probably already working right now. And so the people that will come into the industry will be will be new. You know, like they they won't have any experience. Well, and, I, and I think a lot of people at the university level aren't even looking to be a petroleum engineer or petroleum geologist. I mean, I just see tons of them wanting to be environmental or ESG uh, type stuff instead. Yeah, and 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 if they're getting jobs, you know, in that, then then fine. But but if there's not enough jobs in those sector, you know, eventually those kids uh, are going to need to pay back their student loans. <laughs> Well, uh, so unless again, they just print just like, the money, like, unless they just print the money or waive the loans. Unfortunately, uh, we were talking about this before we start recording. That seems to be what DC wants to do. They want to give away, uh, in, in exchange for votes, they just want to print the money or or guarantee people f- free this and free that and waive people's student loan debt. So, for the last twenty years, you know who has been the highest paid uh, engineer right out of college. Nope. Which one? Petroleum, I'm guessing, since we're doing a oil podcast. <laughs> exactly. Petroleum engineers. If, if you looked at, at your at your exit rate from university, who 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 you were going to get paid, you know, the most to be, it was going to be a petroleum engineer. And you don't even necessarily have to be a petroleum engineer in order to get hired into an oil and gas company. I mean, you know, there's tons of chemical engineers and mechanical engineers and electrical engineers. And then they learn that petroleum component, you know, boots on the ground, you know, and, and just like when I said that, uh, well, the industry will be like seeking headcount, you know, like uh, the first five years of my career, I actually worked in the service sector before going to work for Chevron. And, and I still have a lot of friends that, 
you know, or even guys that I hired that work, uh, you know, even still in the service sector. And, you know, and they're getting older now, you know, they're in their 40s, you know, they have kids, they're wanting to be home more, you know, and they're calling me up and they're saying, so how do I get to work for an operator? You know, and I and I basically tell them, okay, so this is the path, you know, and and these people, you know, they might be chemical engineers or electrical engineers, but they got, you know, again, they got those jobs out of university, you know, that that paid the money that that, you know, gave them the lifestyle that they wanted in the oil and gas industry. So, um, you know, and, and there's and there's paths to cross over from the service sector to the um, the operator sector. But that that jump is made, you know, in in times like this, when companies are desperately seeking people. Because like a, like a major, you know, they would they would drive they would rather hire someone who had ran LWD or been a, a mud logger or a mud engineer uh, who's got 10 or 15 years of experience versus hiring someone straight out of school. Because those people that have already worked on the rig for a decade, they, you know, like they understand operations. You know, they they actually know more about drilling than they realize. And, and then the company, you know, they'll, uh, I mean, they have like the majors, especially they have excellent training programs. They will, they will fill in the gaps, you know, and then, um, you know, even, you know, even in these companies, uh, they tend to have like, um, like four or five engineers that are working underneath like a team lead. And that team lead is usually a senior, senior person with 40 years of experience, 30 years of experience. And they're kind of QCing what all the younger people are doing. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the people that are under the team lead that have more experience, I mean, some of them are pretty self-directed and don't need a lot of help and, and others are, you know, they're, they're basically learning their way, but, you know, but there's, um, you're just not being left, you know, hanging, you know, to go out and design a well and execute a well all by yourself. I mean, your, your designs are being peer reviewed, you know, everything's being QC'd. And, you know, and even if you throw out some things that don't uh, don't make sense, I mean, that's going to be caught in the design process and you're just going to learn along the way and just keep getting better and better. So you brought up ducks. Those are drilled, uncompleted wells. Uh, there was actually a really good article in on oilprice.com, which is the I would say the best free oil and natural gas investing website. And it was a st- statistical analysis showing charts and all the different drilled uncompleted wells. I mean, the oil industry in the Permian, they went through a lot of those drilled uncompleted wells. Though That was the oil production growth that was brought online from the drilled uncompleted. So basically what you're saying is the, the industry has to go and drill more drilled uncompleted wells. And then they ha- and that's going to require a lot more CapEx then going forward to maintain the oil production levels in the Permian. Yeah. So basically in 2020, we had almost 3,500 drilled uncompleted wells. And if you compare that today, we're probably sitting at about 1,000. And, uh, and not all of those 1,000 ducks that are sitting, you know, in the, in the bank, you know, as I said, uh, will get completed. Because some of those wells, they might have actually drilled those wells and they, uh, they didn't deliver the results that they thought they were going to deliver. So, so even though you might have a thousand wells sitting out there, some of them might actually be duds and not ducks. And I think this is the problem with the Permian and shale right now is a lot of that tier one acreage, which were the sweet spots, the best spots, those areas are declining rapidly or already drilled. The industry doesn't have a lot of tier one acreage left, not unless oil prices go to 120, $150 a barrel again. We're basically moving on to tier two acreage, which is not as good a wells and much higher cost capex. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, but, but you also kind of have to look at the other part of the equation, which is commodity price. So, you know, your point becomes a lot more valid with oil around $70 a barrel, because if if a company has a um, has a a, has a break even cost for completing new wells at at 60, 65 dollars. And if the commodity is only 70, you know, they're almost in a break even situation. But if um, if we do see higher oil prices and and oil going up to one hundred dollars a barrel, you know, those those tier two wells, they still look attractive. But but there ends up being a potential other problem on the horizon in that there's not enough um, gas pipeline capacity exiting these uh, these basins. 
And so as these wells get gassier and gassier, if you don't have the pipeline capacity to export the gas, that will force some operators to actually shut in their production or let the production decline because, because they don't have anywhere to put their volumes. And clearly this day and age, you just can't flare the gas in order to produce the oil, which is something that might have happened, you know, 20 years ago. You know, if something got gassy, you just have the flare running, no big deal. You know, you're selling the oil. But but now, you know, the view on that gas is different. So so if you don't have a place to put that associated gas into a pipeline, you're either going to have to drill a second well to re-inject the, uh, the gas into a, a, a reservoir, you know, carbon storage, or, or you're going to have to shut it in. And now we have low natural gas prices because a lot of natural gas production was still coming online. So hopefully that natural gas production will be off by Q3 or Q4 this year. Uh, And then uh, I think demand out of Europe was because they have a a warmer winter than expected. So they didn't buy quite as much LNG. Well, not only that, but it's kind of like a dirty secret of some of these shell players. They actually really need higher gas prices because if their uh, gas oil ratio for their daily production is is 50% gas and 50% oil a lot of their free cash flow in the last you know year especially was was because of the higher natural gas prices and so and so now when you're seeing these low prices you know they they're getting hurt because they still have these volumes but they're not being paid anything for them so does that mean then that even at the current oil price, so if oil companies putting on their investors presentation that their break even is lower, their lifting costs is lower, if they have that high gas to oil ratio, so 50%, that company <clears throat> might not have a free cash flow then at a 70, $73 a barrel West Texas intermediate then because they have so much natural gas then. So they're actually losing money producing them. Yeah, you always have to read those fine notes, right? So if it says, okay, these economics are run at $75 a barrel, it's, it's normally like $75 a barrel and, and $350, you know, per MMCF, you know, which is the, the gas equivalent. So you always need to look at the price that they're modeling for their barrels as well as, well as their gas, and then and then look at what the volumes are to see how big of an impact that gas is, especially if they've modeled a much higher gas price than than what we're seeing in the market today. Very interesting. Good points there. So I want to transition now to something that you spent a lot of time in your video presentation a month ago on, and that's deep water. So you've talked about just the return on investment some of these companies are getting in the new plays, whether that's Guiana, Suriname, or Petrobras. We were, we were discussing Petrobras before we started recording. You actually said that Petrobras has the best return on investment on oil wells right now of any oil company? I believe so. So Petrobras already has at least a dozen wells that individually those wells produce more than 50,000 barrels of oil per day. There are some small companies in the Permian that their entire company doesn't even produce that. And that would be a single well from, from some of these uh, deep water uh, fields in Brazil. And, and, and that's definitely um, world-class. I mean, that's, that's the best of the best. So when you look at the, uh, the recovery per well worldwide, I mean, uh, Brazil and Guyana are basically top of the charts. So, so is is that return on investment? That's low decline. Uh, excuse me, that's low decline rate wells. What are you looking at exactly? Yeah, so it is. It's 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 the, first of all, they're low decline, and and then they just the 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 volumes that they produce at are just prolific compared to the volume that a shell well produces at. They they might be producing. 40 or 50 times the flow rate per well that a shell well produces at. And then you don't have to worry about that 60% decline rate uh, in the first year and then over 80% decline rate after three years. Yeah. I mean, those wells might only be declining, you know, 15 or 20% per year. So, so it's, you know, everyone talks about how deep water wells are so expensive, but they're not expensive per barrel. So yes, it looks expensive if you just say, okay, a shell well cost, you know, five hundred thousand or whatever, fifty thousand. I don't even know what it is off the top of my head, but it, you know, versus a, a deep water well that might cost one hundred and fifty million, 
you know, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, a, a half a million uh, versus 150 million, like that's, that's insane. But then when you look at the volume that's produced from a deep water well versus a shell well, then you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so you're talking about amortizing the cost over more goods. So more barrel, so that 150 million, if Petrobras or another deep water company invested 150 million, they would have more reserves. They would have more production for longer periods of time with less dec decline rate. So over longer periods of time, then that that investment then would return a higher investment with more free cash flow. Yeah, exactly. And that's also why Exxon would rather own more deep water Guyana assets then they would want to own more Permian. And because use, because because the deep water you're getting volume and you're getting value per barrel. So ExxonMobil was the one who discovered this what uh, a few years ago that these major fields, but also the company you worked for, Hess Oil now, they have more of their production that's going to come. So they might be a better pure play for the Guiana than ExxonMobil. Yeah. So Hess has the most torque. So basically in 2015, uh, uh, Exxon discovered the first um, uh, commercial oil field in Guyana, which was called the Lisa oil field. And they owned, I want to say, 45 percent of that uh, prospect. And then they they drilled it with partners Hess and uh, Sinoc. And Sinoc is the Chinese oil company. And uh, and so so basically ever since then, they've just kept finding more oil like since 20 um since 2019 or sorry 2015 they've discovered more than 12 billion recoverable barrels offshore Guyana and the break even on those barrels is anywhere between 25 and 40 dollars a barrel so even if oil would to would basically pull all the way back to 50 dollars a barrel all these Guyana oil fields are still making money versus the Permian, which now uh, when you look at what their costs are, they're occurring today is like almost all of those Permian fields would be underwater. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like absolutely in love, you know, with Guyana. I mean, it's uh, it, it's, it's the biggest oil and gas success story, you know, of, of our lifetime because, because basically that uh, area, that country, that basin People, uh, countries had, or had companies had been trying to find oil there for uh, 50 years. And they had, like, every time they drilled a well, they would see traces of oil and they would see indications that there should be oil there. But, um, and then, and then there were also some wells that, you know, they were having all these good shows, but then all of a sudden there would be a pressure ramp or temperature ramp and and something would cause them to have to uh, stop the drilling because the well hadn't been designed to uh, encounter like the high pressure, high temperature situations. And 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 then finally, after 50 years of exploring and 50 years of learnings and, and this and technology increases uh, in terms of like seismic analysis and whatnot, Finally, Exxon goes in and they they design their wells to, you know, drill deeper than anyone else had. And and bam, you know, they find this huge world cast class discovery. And then ever since uh, 2015, they've continued to explore their license and they've just found, you know, discovery after discovery after discovery. I mean, it's amazing. And um, like for people who are. Uh, you know, geophysically inclined. So basically, you know, the earth, they have all these, uh, these different layers. And with the, um, with, with Exxon, like most of their uh, finds so far have been in the, um, hold on. Yeah. So most, most of the discoveries have been in the Mastrician and the Campanian uh, geologic layers of the earth. And um, so this block that they're in, the fairway, it keeps extending into the neighbor country, Suriname, which is right next door. And Total and Apache have had multiple discoveries uh, in, in that block, like right along the same fairway as, as Exxon and Hess. And, and what, um, what Apache did was they drilled even deeper and they found uh, a lot of oil and gas deposits in the Santonian layer which is beneath the Mastrician and the Campanian. And, and when Total and Apache started finding that oil there, 
you know, then Hess and Exxon start reviewing their Earth models and they start thinking, huh, maybe we should test that layer underneath all of our current discoveries. And that's what they're starting to do now. And they're starting to find more uh, oil underneath their existing discoveries. And, and they currently believe, and this hasn't been proven, but they believe that they might be able to double the barrels that they've already found by drilling even deeper into the Santonian layer. And, and so like when you think about the lifespan of a field, uh, so basically the biggest hurdle is, is that first investment decision, FID, when, when basically you say you have enough barrels to justify doing a big development. And, and that's where you're getting these break-evens for uh, Guyana of 35 to $40 a barrel. For other places in the world, it might be 70 or 80 or $60 a barrel. You know, even, even for some shale plays, like it, you know, so there's some shale fields that might even need $65 a barrel in order to justify the cost of drilling a new well. But, but anyway, so back to Guyana, if you've already justified uh, your FPSO and they have already justified, they, I think they've got two online already and they've got uh, another four in the queue and they've got a line of sight uh, between now um, and, and the end of the decade of having at least 10 there. So once, once they've already got those 10 FPSOs, that are producing from the Maastrichtian and the Campanian, if they want to just drill deeper in the Santonian and, and tap into more oil that they tie back to those existing FPSOs, the break-even cost on those wells, I mean, could even be $15 or $20 a barrel. And, and that's why I'm like insanely bullish on, on Hess. Um, you know, I also own um, to, uh, Apache, which is partnered with uh, Total again in Suriname, because I, I believe that the same story is going to play out there to some degree. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I, and I continue to watch the companies along that fairway. I mean, there's uh, I'm, you know, I'm probably like super annoying to everyone on Twitter because I'm always talking about these two little known companies, which is uh, Frontera Energy and CGX Energy. But I'm always talking about them because they're currently drilling uh, they have a small slice of this fairway and they're currently drilling what could be their second discovery. And, and, you know, me, I'm a petroleum engineer. I used to work in exploration strategy and planning. You know, I, I was a drilling engineer for a number of years. I mean, it's, it's only natural for me to be excited about what I perceive can be a game changing, you know, discovery. So, and then, and then also too, I tend to champion the underdogs. So if there is a company that nobody else is talking about, and if I truly believe in their assets, you know, I'll stick my neck out and talk about them. So do you think then these smaller companies, <clears throat> which you mentioned in your video presentation a month ago, like a Frontera or CGX, would they be attractive then to a larger company like Chevron? So if <clears throat> Chevron is late to go, excuse me. So if Chevron is late to going into Guyana and Suriname, would Chevron say, well, we don't have the land leases that these other companies do. We should just go buy the little ones then so we have access to this play. Correct. Except Chevron already owns a small block adjacent to Frontera and CGX block. Uh, Total actually owns a block on either side. And Exxon's block with Hess is directly north of, of their block. So, so this little these little companies are surrounded by all the, the majors. And, and they're like literally, they, they own the only slice that isn't already locked up by a major IOC. And, you know, and again, I used to work in the industry. I know a lot of people who still work in the industry. I mean, I know for a fact that all these major companies are tracking these guys. They're watching the well results. They've been to their data room before this well was being spud. And, and, you know, I'm invested there because, you know, I believe that if they have a major discovery, that one of these majors is going to come in and they're either going to farm into the acreage or they're going to buy the entire company. Uh, there's one more deep water company I want to get your thoughts on that's uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, so Talos. So you talked about them 
I, I know that Pemex, uh, their Cantarell well, which was, I think, deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, one of the largest oil fields discovered in the 70s, around for many decades, That that's depleted now. Is this the largest discovery in Mexico in many, many decades? Oh, the, the Zama, yeah. So so there was an oil licensing, licensing round. Um, I don't know exactly when it was, but the basically the last, the, ma- the last major oil licensing round in Mexico, different companies, including... Um, Talos had went in there and and bid on uh, acreage, and then and then Talos went on to drill what was the best discovery in Mexico in decades, and that was the Zama oil field. They drilled three wells to prove up the volumes, which it looks like it's eight uh, eight hundred and fifty million equi- equivalent barrels, and um, and Pemex owned the block right next door. They actually had a commitment that they needed to drill a well on their acreage in order to demonstrate that the reservoir extended into their block. But but actually some shady stuff happened. I mean, you know, this is Mexico and they have a history of doing shady things. And what what actually ended up happening was the Mexican government more or less said that when they unitized that oil field, they gave the majority of the working interest over to Pemex. So um, hypothetically, you know, based off of of Talos and their partners outlook, their partnership should have owned like maybe 59% of that 850 million barrels but but when the Mexican government looked at it, they they were like, oh no, uh, Pemex owns you know fifty one percent of that, and and they and they gave a lot of that asset over to Pemex like unfairly. So so that decision had been disputed in court for a number of years. Um, but let's face it, it's really hard to fight the government, especially when your own government isn't backing you up, which is kind of what happened with uh, Talos and its partners. Because so, so you know, obviously Talos Energy is a U.S. company. Its two partners were European companies. And, and with everything happening in COVID, like, I mean, their governments just really didn't back them up. So, so what, what's actually happened is I think Talos has finally just decided, you know what, like the, uh, the longer we fight, the longer it's going to take for uh, a barrel to actually be produced there, we're we're losing money in terms of time value of money, and and so uh, I guess somebody had just recently approached them, Carlos Sim, which is like a big. Um, uh, he's the richest man in Mexico. Yeah, he's a billionaire. Yeah, he's a yeah Mexican billionaire, and I guess Carlos Slim basically said, "Hey, if you give me half your working interest, we can monetize that right now." for $125 million, which basically says that Talos's stake in that discovery would be worth $250 million at, at today's price. Uh, that was announced last night. And even with that announcement, like the stock was down today because, you know, obviously the market just didn't care. So, <laughs> which which is like super frustrating because Talos trades at uh, like 30%, I think of its, of the, of the, um, of its PV 10 of their producing assets. And they never, like their share price has actually never shown any value for, for Zama in recent years. And so, so when that announcement was made last night about this farm down, I, I was thinking, okay, well, the market just said they've got an asset that's worth 250 million. Like the, the market should have at least um, the stock market should have at least given them credit for that, but today they didn't. But you know, it's also a Friday going into a long weekend, so maybe things will be different on Tuesday. I mean, we'll just have to see. Well, it probably takes an institutional investor or, or an oil analyst. I mean, a lot of people are on vacation now since the holiday weekend's coming up. A lot of people aren't going to have time to read through all the agree- all the details of the agreement and look at that. So, yeah, uh, eventually- and that's, I, I kind of thought that too. I mean, it's it's always thin trading going into a holiday. And, and, you know, plus, you know, Fridays during the summer, I mean, people don't want to work anyway. <laughs> so, well, I mean, so if, it's just not if, the best day. It's not the best time to make a major announcement, you know. But if Carlos Slim is backing them on this deal, then I think the Mexican government might not be able to bully them as much. So maybe then the assets, uh, the company's assets will get a, a better valuation by the market. Well, I mean, the floor is already in, right? The floor should be $250 million um, dollars for that asset because... Because 
Carlos Slim paid half of that for his half. So, so, you know, so like is, is this common, a little... common sense says, okay, you just got 250 million or, or 125 million. That's going to go to your treasury. And, and the remaining asset should be worth at least 125 million. Well, I'm so, not familiar with Talos. Are they like a micro cap company with a really tiny market cap? So I think their, their market cap is uh, slightly less than 2 billion. They, um, it was either the first quarter or the, of this year or the last quarter of last year. They actually uh, merged with Inven. And so they're now the sixth largest oil and gas producer in the Gulf of Mexico. So this Mexico, um, the, the Zama situation has actually kind of been like a, a dead chicken around their, na- their neck because all of the uh, the controversy around what was happening with the Mexican government was kind of keeping investors away from it. And, and investors have more, more or less ignored the fact that they're still um, producing, you know, from their U.S. domiciled assets. Yeah, this is <laughs> so, the risk. We were discussing this last week. This is a risk, geopolitical risk with investing in Brazil and Petrobras or Mexico or some of these other South American countries with an oil discovery or even in Africa with the East African oil is geopolitical risk. So the oil fields themselves, I mean, the return on investment, what you're saying for Petrobras for the oil fields, their top eight oil fields are as large as any other oil producers. The risk there is geopolitical and corruption with the Brazilian government and all the scandals that Petrobras has had in the past. Yeah, but let's face it. It doesn't matter where you put your money with the exception of cash. You're you're taking on some kind of risk, whether that risk be operational risk or geopolitical risk. I mean, he even here in the United States, like when we go back to the shell discussion that kind of kicked us off and the fact that there's not enough pipeline capacity in the years ahead for the associated gas if the U.S. government doesn't allow more pipelines to be put into place, like that in itself is a bit of a geopolitical risk for, you know, for for assets that are that are uh, near peak throughput values already. Yeah, this is the risk with all natural resource companies. So an oil field, a mine, once the company invests into a mine, which is billions of dollars, a copper mine or a gold mine or large scale oil fields, Unfortunately, especially if commodity prices go up a lot, the governments tend to want to change the rules with the royalty taxes. Oh, our national oil company is a silent partner. I mean, in Argentina, they did even worse than that. When Argentina started drilling out their shale oil fields and their oil production of YPF, I think their their former president confiscated. They nationalized all the uh, oil assets there. (laughs) Yeah, but, you know, I mean, even look at what happened in the U.S. here with the Keystone Pipeline. Canada had already built their half of the pipeline. We were well underway having built our portion of the pipeline. And in, and in basically the third quarter of the, of the game prior to turning this pipeline online, all of a sudden the U.S. government says, no, you know, you're not going to complete that project. So, so again, it's like, it's like. Um, Just bad energy it, policy across the board. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's, and, 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 you know, and I know Josh, like I talked to him from time to time. And 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 I'm just like, hey, you know, it's it's not even worth fighting which country is more risky in this day and age, <laughs> because because like they're stink on on every single country right now. And and the risk is why you might make money in the end. Well, the value, yeah, the market may discount. I mean, you just mentioned Talos there. That sounds like a really deep discount for a big discovery. Well, it's it's not even 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 ignoring their discovery, their producing assets are heavily discounted right now. Even even if they didn't own Zama, every barrel that they're producing right now is trading, you know, at like two times their free cash flow. I mean, it's ridiculous. But you know, but again, we're also talking about a smaller company in the energy sector and and um you know, and, and this was actually something else that I uh, spoke with with Josh about, you know, and I'm like, I'm like on Twitter, like oil investors, like we're constantly going after each other, you know, saying this basin is better than this other basin, yada, 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 you know, whether it be because shells peaking or because there's geopolitical risk in Latin American countries or blah, blah, blah. The, the real issue is that there's not enough investors 
in the oil and gas sector. I mean, you know, we're 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 here. We're trying to defend companies that have a PE multiple of two and three and four. And I mean, even the major IOCs. I mean, their PE multiple is seven. I mean, like, give me a break. That's like a disgusting multiple. The the um, well, Christine. What, what unfortunately, fixes, what fixes all this is energy getting a higher percentage of the S and P five hundred. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but things are headed. You know, but, we all win together if if the if the market will just fairly value, you know, oil and gas for the necessary commodity that it is. Unfortunately, Christine, things are headed in the exact opposite direction. We have these institutional investors and these billionaire activist investors that are joint, trying to join the board of, board of, board of directors of Exxon Mobil buying equity stakes. And they are anti and uh, conventional energy, anti coal, anti oil, anti natural gas, anti LNG. Some of them are even anti nuclear power. So they and then a lot of these institutional investors that could buy oil stocks, they have in their policy mandates now they can't buy um, conventional energy and oil plays. So they have to invest a certain percentage now in ESG. I know banks and other institutional investors have these mandates now. So even if they wanted to, if you're an institutional investment manager and asset manager for large scale, say pension funds, you might not be able to buy oil stocks because you have ESG policy mandates that you can't now. Yeah, but I do believe that eventually common sense prevails, especially in a high interest rate. Well, I'm just saying, especially in a high interest rate environment. You know, I feel like the market right now, I mean, all the lemmings, you know, they um, momentarily piled into energy and then now they piled back out again and they're and they're reverting back to, you know, their techie things that they like. But, you know, and 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 there's this assumption that interest rates are going to go down. I personally don't believe that interest rates are going to be going down for years. And so and so year over year. If you're in a company that isn't producing a lot of free cash flow and and debt is eating you alive, eventually these oil and gas companies that continue to make money at seventy dollars a barrel, I mean, oil and gas looks great. A lot of maybe not all companies, but a lot of companies. Talos looks excellent at seventy dollars a barrel. You know, eventually their um, you know their their fundamentals, you know, just start looking too good, good, too good to ignore, especially if they keep aggressively buying back stock. So, so in my opinion, I mean, that's really what the sector needs to do is is they just need to keep buying back, keep buying back because, because, you know, when the lendings pile out, if these companies can support their floors, that, that eventually will lead to, you know, greater, greater confidence in the sector you know, I mean, at, at least that's my that's my hope. That's my investment thesis is that is that eventually common sense will prevail. And oil and energy have the lowest valuation in the S&P 500 of the 11 different sectors. And it's by wide margin. I think even the mining sector has doubled the price to earnings ratio of oil and natural gas at this point. That's how cheap, hated and and unloved the oil and energy sector has been in the last six to 12 months. It's just really things have reversed. Wow. Since the oil bull market there, what in late 2021 and for most of 2022? Yeah, we had like all of the three good months, you know. And then, like I said, it was the lemmings they piled in, and then the lemmings piled right back out again. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for them to return. Well, there's there's a ton of global macro hedge fund managers that are short oil. I mean, they're the. Uh, oil futures contracts, the amount of oil futures contracts being created. I think uh, hedge fund manager Harris Kupperman, who specializes in commodities, was seeing at six billion dollars per day with their worth of new futures contracts that are going heavily net short. But I want to get your thoughts on um, as we wrap up here on Transocean, Cedral, some of these deep water offshore companies that have the the deep water platform. So you describe where the growth of the oil production is going to come from. Do you think Transocean and these other deep water platform companies, are they going to benefit from this? Yeah, I mean, basically all uh, service providers that are, um, you know, focused on on deep water, and, and it doesn't even have to be a drilling rig provider. I mean, it could be a company that provides subsea umbilicals or subsea wellheads, riser systems, you know, things like that. Um, you know, the, the future growth, in my, in my opinion, it's going to, it's going to come from from offshore and it's going to come from international place. So, so like, that's where I see 
the the growth trajectory you know coming from you know it's not going to be the permian shale it's going to be the argentinian shale and and believe it or not the the world's biggest shale asset that could that could readily scale if if investment dollars flowed to it actually exist in russia <laughs> but but under the current well, environment well, Me- mexico they- also has one too right across the border right the eagle ford there's the formation right across the border mexico but that's right where the juarez cartel controls the entire area so i, well, I don't see investment there yeah but but also i mean the eagle the eagle ford's not the permian you know like i said when you because because really that's what you're looking for right is you're looking for that next permian so so saudi has a lot of shell assets that they are um going to eventually turn online like like they're already recruiting like they're looking for uh for shale experienced people from the permian that'll that'll move over to saudi arabia and work in their fields to develop their fields you know i mean it's not something that's going to happen overnight you know i mean it took a, it took a decade for the permian to, to scale up and it'll take at least half that for these um for these these other global basins to scale up but i mean there's there's always something on the horizon it's just a matter of how much money is being thrown at it and how quickly it can scale. And and kind of, you know, to roll back to that labor situation, I mean, we really are in a situation where, you know, we're kind of the industry's labor constrained and, you know, and it's also um, kind of constrained in terms of equipment and rigs and whatnot. I mean, the, uh, even land rigs, like they they've pulled back almost half of what they were trading at. Uh, recently, because there's all this fear that rigs are going to get laid down because of the low gas prices. But, you know, and I and I and I see all this fear and the, the hyperbole, you know, playing out on social media. And and I see the stocks basically being oversold because of it. And, you know, and it's just irrational, like it's irrational the way the market's moving, because you shouldn't see a company's market cap cut in half, because maybe, 10% of its rigs are no longer running. And, and it's also going to end up being a, a seasonal phenomenon because, because they're, you know, rigs are mobile. You know, if the U S doesn't want to use its rigs, I mean, it's predicted that Canada is, is wanting to grow its rig share account. And, and so these rigs can move up to Canada they can move down to Mexico, you know, they they can be uh, broke down into into containers and, and shipped to China and wherever they need to go. And, and that's that's what ends up happening. You know, like during COVID, um, the rig provider that I actually was the first provider I purchased was Neighbors Drilling. And, and even though the U.S. was a complete disaster, I knew to buy Neighbors Drilling because I knew that they had the largest drilling contract with uh, Saudi Aramco. And I knew that Saudi Aramco wasn't going to lay down their rigs. <laughs> so well, yeah, they're the I, just cost like, I just kept buying yeah. neighbors, you know, because I, I was like, these guys are making money, you know, they've got the international con- uh, contracts, they're not going to zero. Yeah, and so, they have the, the contracts with the lowest cost producer too. So that also helps. Yeah. Well, you tend to make premium rates when you're sending your gear overseas. So that's, some, that's something an oil insider like you would know. That the uh, the extra fees premium there to to ship it overseas, but I, I see a train wreck coming, Christine, for the oil market in the next twelve to twenty four months. Uh, Goldman Sachs is actually predicting an oil crisis in twenty twenty four because just in the last couple months we've seen the data come out. OPEC production on its own, the April survey data is starting to fall. That's without another OPEC cut and them announcing another OPEC cut, which they might do in the next couple months or certainly before the end of the year. So we could see additional produ- production cuts from OPEC, but production from OPEC is falling on its own. And then the data that came out in the last week or two, oil demand now globally is at a record high. So all these things are setting up. Meanwhile, in the short term, because of, I would say, global macro data, so global economic data, people looking at higher interest rates, problems with the banks, uh, consumer discretionary spending, you just see all these hedge fund managers and the markets in the short term, Christine, are not efficient. They're not rational. So these people are seeing recession, higher interest rates, bankruptcies, less consumer discretionary spending. That means less oil demand, less consumption, but that's not what the data is saying globally. So, so we have these hedge fund managers that are shorting oil and energy while the data is saying that demand for oil globally is actually growing. You know, or they're just creating a narrative that allows them to buy back in at cheaper prices. So, you know, it's um, 
but 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 when you look at the um, the supply de- the demand scenario, I mean, I'm right there with you in terms of the supp- the supply not being enough to meet the demand in the years ahead, and and that's because of the eight years of underinvestment. There 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 just aren't fields all over the world that are that we can scale up and and activate you know on a dime you know it, it takes years from finding a major discovery to bringing it online and and even though we might have like 40 fields uh globally that are in that pre-development phase where they're working on them you know like those those fields will come on at, at, at different times you know i mean it's I said it's well that's counterbalanced by the super cycle you know that's what it's setting up to be so So and 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 all these all these policies the government policies that are restricting scaling oil and gas within their within their borders and all the activists that are uh trying to restrain the uh the capital reinvestment from the oil producers all that does is set up this scenario for oil prices to go higher yeah, I agree. It's it's restricting supply. That's the main theme here is a lot of these policy decisions, either by institutional investors, activist investors, governments forcing ESG mandates. I think the European Union is trying to force really high ESG investing mandates on ExxonMobil Chevron for their European assets, and they're fighting them in court. But all that does is just res- restrict oil and natural gas supply domestically. I mean, I, I, you can Google for a lot of these countries, they want to build a liquefied natural gas import facility. But most of these countries, Christine, they don't allow oil and natural gas drilling inside their own country. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there's also like we're starting to see pushback now from Latin American and from African nations because these oil rich uh, impoverished n- nations like they're they're wanting to put pipelines in their countries. They're wanting to build these plants. They're they're wanting investors to come in and explore. And and these activists that keep going after them, what what they're what they're actually uh, starting to point out is is it's starting to look like there's going to end up being um, uh, some head knocking occur from you know the um, the impoverished nations. And and the ESG crowd, so it, so it's like, hey, you know, you, you can only choose one, right? You know, either either choose this the um, the ESG narrative, the climate narrative, and and accept the fact that all these nations are going to stay poor, or you moderate the client narr- the the climate narrative, and you look for solutions for carbon emissions, and you you allow these poor nations to develop and grow. Which, which in my mind, is the preferred solution. You know, I think that we have um, technologies on the horizon, such as such as um, gains in efficiency and carbon storage, that continue to make oil and gas the preferred solution. You know, for energy. Yeah, we were and, discussing and- before we started recording that a lot of these politicians, like Gavin Newsom in California, he wants. Um, internal combustion engine cars banned in the state of California, no selling, no usage by 2030. Well, there's not enough materials to make enough electric vehicles. So it, the, the policy is just totally unrealistic. Well, well, not only that, but I mean, imagine some um, some entrepreneur shows up one day with uh, with a carburetor that's zero emissions. Then then what's his his debate going to be? I mean, I don't think that that's out of the the, the uh, scope of, of of feasibility that there would be some kind of filter on your car that that would make it zero emissions. Why not? If the politicians can profit from it or take more control, I think they're in favor of it. So the the narrative, the ESG stuff. I mean, there's a lot of grift involved there, a waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse in the federal government level, the Department of Energy, the infrastructure bills, and stuff like that. So I think that's kind of the theme here that DC wants is they want to push this for more control and more government spending, and then they could steal or siphon off more wealth for themselves, friends, family, um, special interest groups, whoever's paying them the lobby or uh, negotiate, uh, move stuff into the bills. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of, of short sighted policies at play for sure, but you know, but at the end of the the day, the pendulum will swing so so far that it's forced to swing back to the middle. And with common sense solutions, because because you can't 
uh, swing the pendulum too far before you start hurting others. And and once you've hurt so many people that uh, that you start losing elections, you know, then then you start moderating. And, uh, the, you know, the real question is, is when are we going to get there? Well, California is paying super high gasoline prices, even though oil prices are down. And that's because the government keeps putting new taxes on on each gallon of gasoline. All these taxes are at it. It's a dirty secret. The Tax Foundation did a study on this years ago that the state of California and the counties and the cities, when you add up all the taxes per gallon of gasoline sold, they make the state of California and all the counties and cities make way more money per gallon than ExxonMobil and all the refiners do. Yeah, but for the first time in history, we also saw the population in the state of Cal- California decline. California lost house seats and Texas gained house seats. I mean, that's so. So, again, it's it's like you're starting to see the start of this pendulum swinging. You know, you're they're they're punishing their people in their industry so much that they're migrating. Oh, yeah, I have with, I, I, I have no CPAs and other people in the state of California. I lived there for over 15 years when I, where I grew up and just small businesses are being destroyed there by all their stupid policies. I mean, it, it's it's actually kind of funny because someone reached out to me this week and they said that they were uh, recommending or they were they were representing a couple LPs in, in California and and they wanted to know if I might be interested in consulting or something for them. But then but then he alluded that I might have to move. And I was like, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, not to California. I mean, visiting California is okay. I, I wouldn't move back there, not with the current taxes uh, yeah, and just, policies. You know, I just kind of laughed because I'm thinking, wow, it's like you're going to try to get people from Texas to move to California. I'm like, I'm like, there would have to be some pretty big advantages associated, associated with that hiring package. And unfortunately, things are headed in the opposite direction with taxes and policies in the state of California and the county level. It's just a, it's just a mess there. I mean, it's a beautiful state. It should have a great economy. And then all the problems are caused by uh, pol- uh, rules, regulations, taxes, red tape, all the other stuff that's coming from the politicians and bureaucrats and regulators there. But Christine, as we, I've kept you for over an hour, you're a wealth of information on oil, natural gas. Are you planning on uh, making a newsletter or something like that on Substack or Patreon with some of your articles about um, petroleum geology and oil companies and growth? I mean, not like not at the moment. Um I, I have, I mean, I've recently done a couple podcasts with, with people who, you know, like somebody found me on Twitter and said, Hey, get on my show. And then next thing you know, like somebody else who listened to his show was saying, Hey, I want you on my show now. So that that's kind of what's playing out um, in my life is, is I've, I've got, you know, people like yourself who are trying to share information that are interviewing me. Um, I, I haven't really decided uh, what I'm going to do next um, in terms of if I want to, um, write a newsletter or whatnot. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be 46 years old this year. I mean, I've already, you know, made good money as an investor. Um, I, I have to kind of sometimes ask my question, you know, like what's the point of, of dedicating a whole lot of time to a monthly newsletter? Um, like what's the end game or, or can I kind of just keep, uh, doing what I'm doing and occasionally putting out content and and maybe that um, you know gets the same number of 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 interest across you know because because to me like the way I look at it is you know I've got a point of view which obviously I want to get across but I prefer to communicate it through people like yourself who have already built a huge following <laughs> so. So, so it's like, I don't necessarily want to compete with you in terms of building a huge following. You know, if, if I can get on your, you know, on your show once a year or whatever, I mean, that's, I'm happy with that. You know, I think that's great. So, well, I, I think my listeners are going to really enjoy this interview and I think you'll be on more than once a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if my well hits. So we'll, we'll see how that goes <laughs> because, uh, because yeah, if this, if this well I've been talking about for ages hits, I, I, I think there's going to be a whole lot of people reaching out to me saying, hey, we want you on our exploration team, but we'll see what happens. So is this the ones uh, are you the ones earlier mentioned, the ones mentioned earlier in Guiana or Suriname? Yeah, the one uh, the one that's being drilled by uh, Frontera Energy and CGX Energy. I mean, they're they're literally in the final days of this well. So I think here in the next month, there's going to be a well result. So there's been some shenanigans uh, going on recently with the stock. And they had to sidetrack the well, um, but a lot of the leading indicators 
that they reported uh, were actually all positive, even though the stock sold off. I'm like, what is the stock doing? I'm like, everything they said was good. And and you, you can even um, go look at the notes from their earnings call. Like I was on Frontera Energy's earnings call, aggressively asking them questions about what they'd seen in the well thus far. And almost everything that they said to me was a positive indicator. So so I'm I'm just waiting, you know, I'm cooling my heels and I'm and I'm just waiting um, waiting for results. And, you know, and, and again, if they, if they deliver a high, um, uh, pay encounter, then I think in the, in the next following months, we'll, we'll end up seeing them either getting bought out, uh, entirely or a huge farm in into their acreage, which would be, you know, just like this Talos deal. So, so Talos, they, that Zama development, it's, uh, it's actually undeveloped. So those are discovered barrels and that will be produced, you know, five to seven years in the future. And, and basically, uh, Carlos Slim gave them about $1.70 per barrel for those barrels, um, which is kind of a floor. Like, really, that should have been a much higher price Uh would have probably been delivered in any other nation, except the fact that it was Mexico, like kind of discounted the value that they were going to get. So in Suriname, when Total farmed into Apache's discovery in 2019, they actually got $2 a barrel for their discoveries. And, and um, so, you know, two, you know, that kind of range is kind of like a floor but but also that was in 2019. So we've got four more years of success under the belt in this basin. And so as, as a basin matures, the dollar per barrel that someone will pay for a discovery, uh, it climbs. So so maybe it's as only- a reserve. So as the reserves from the other companies find more discoveries, the reserves get proved up. Then yeah, investors so basically, are- basically, when you look at an oil field, there's there's three different um, uh, life stages. There's frontier where you hardly know anything about the basin. You might only have you know one or none you know discoveries in there. That's considered frontier. So when when the Lisa well was drilled in Guyana by uh, by Exxon, that was a frontier well, and but that was in 2015. And, and then when the Maka well was drilled in Suriname by, by Apache, that was the first well discovery that happened there. That was also considered frontier and, and front and, and total farmed in for the $2 a barrel. And, you know, but now, uh, so that was 2019. Now we've got four more years of repeat discoveries and success along that fairway in the basin. And so now the basin is no longer frontier. Now it's considered emerging. And emerging fields tend to get, you know, three Higher times, valuations. Yeah, three times yes. the price. So, so if if something got two dollars per barrel in 2019, you know, hypothetically it could get six dollars a barrel now. So, I mean, we'll just see. Like, we'll see what happens with this deal. But I, I mean, I'm I get my numbers from benchmarking. I mean, I'm an engineer, so so I you know I look back in history and I see what I can benchmark, and and then I come up with my. Um, my windows of opportunity per se. And, and so I'm just like, I'm just saying, you know, based off of history, uh, I think that those barrels, if they have a huge discovery might go for anywhere between two and $6 a barrel. Well, it sounds like your dogs want this interview to end. I want to thank you so much for your time and I'll attach a link to your Twitter profile, which is she drill. So I'll put that um, below the information and description section of the video, along with your uh, very long presentation on these plays going into more in depth. And you have lots of charts in there. I think you also subscribe to an expensive petroleum geologist magazine too. too. So you're really very interested in the details and you're, you're kind of looking to get way ahead of the curve years in advance, finding some of these new discoveries. Correct.